Good afternoon, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name is Constantine Hatcher, the Statewide Organizing Director for California Yimby, and I'm so thrilled that you all are joining us today for the discussion with a very special guest around the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act and the legacy of segregation that current housing policy continues to reinforce today. But before we get to that, I first want to thank you so much for joining us. And so we can facilitate the most constructive and, and, and virtual event, all participants are muted. However, we do strongly encourage you to use the Q&A box for any questions. We want your questions, please. And we'll try to, if we don't get to them in this call, we'll try to also answer them after the call as well. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so, and it will be posted on the website afterwards. So um, if you want to watch again or share with friends and colleagues, we also encourage you to do so. And, and we also will be sending out a brief survey tomorrow. Please take a moment to complete so we can be sure to provide you with the most impactful content possible. Um, we know that this is a challenging time for us all, especially those on the front lines putting themselves in harm's way. To our nurses, doctors, first responders, cleaning staffs, grocery workers, transit workers, and delivery folks who are heroically staring this ugly virus down every day and making it possible for folks like us to stay alive and not endanger our loved ones and our neighbors. We see you, we thank you, and we appreciate you to no end. We hope all of you are doing well and are safe during this crazy time. And for those of you whose loved ones this, this virus has touched, we would are sending all the love for a quick and speedy recovery. And that's why also we'll continue to help amplify messages from official government, um, state and local authorities on in public health channels to do our part to keep people safe and support their efforts at all levels and assist the most vulnerable neighbors amongst us. This pandemic has highlighted even more than ever the fundamental inequities in our communities across the state and country, specifically for, for people of color. Inequities deeply rooted in decades of racist housing policy. That's why I'm particularly excited about this first installment of our housing and social equity series as part of our larger commitment to continue moderating these informative and valuable uh, virtual conversations with experts with deep knowledge on these issues and you over the coming weeks. After all, knowledge is power and there is still so much to do, especially during this time to make sure California is a great and safe place to live for all of our neighbors, especially those ones that, that don't have the same voices that we do. That's what passionately brings me and the whole team here at California EMB to this work. And while we're so excited about the whole, this about today's conversation, and with that, I will pass the mic to our founder and CEO, who set the vision and mission for this scrappy band of do-gooders here at California Envy to be so ostentatious to think that with your help we can change the world. Brian, take it away. Uh, th thank you so much, Constantine, uh, for that uh, fantastic intro. Uh, so it is my immense privilege uh, to introduce Richard Rothstein, uh, senior fellow at the Othering and Belonging Institute, distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute. Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and the author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Here at California Yimby, we believe that everyone should be able to benefit from California's boundless opportunity to achieve their full potential. Our mission is to make California an affordable place to live, work, and raise a family. While we believe that we absolutely can put California on a path of broad-based economic prosperity and create vibrant, livable, and inclusive communities for everyone, we need to acknowledge that we're not going to achieve racial justice by just ending a few racist housing laws. As Richard's book makes clear, governments at all levels conspired, often with the enthusiastic participation of the private sector, to create racially segregated communities, oftentimes where they didn't even exist before. In the white areas, government policy worked to foster upward economic mobility and wealth accumulation through home ownership. In black areas, government investment, when it occurred, often took the form of public rental housing and denied residents the opportunity to build wealth. Housing is the platform for economic advancement, social development, education, health, you name it. The harms that accrued disproportionately to African Americans and also to other people of color persist across generations and will not be easily undone. California Yimby is committed to advancing fair housing, but we need to acknowledge that we, like many Yimbys, are new to this space. I believe it's past time that we Yimbys, whatever our background, make common cause with fair housing advocates and fight to overturn exclusionary housing policies in the legislature and at the ballot box. 
we don't have all the answers, but I'm so excited to, to learn more from Richard about our past so that we can better chart our future forward. And with that, Richard, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Constantine. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, YIMBY is one of my favorite organizations, among others. Um, as, as you all know, uh, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by uh, challenging segregation in law schools because civil rights litigators figured that if judges couldn't understand anything else, they might be able to figure out that you couldn't get a, a good legal education in a segregated and inferior law school. And then they went on to use that precedent to challenge segregation in colleges and universities. And in 1954, we had the Brown versus Board of Education decision that prohibited legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. That Brown decision then stimulated, empowered a, a movement of activists that engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. Um, some lost their lives in that struggle to redress segregation in a variety of areas. Uh, lunch counter sit-ins sit and uh, uh, bus uh, segregation actions uh, resulted in the integration of uh, restaurants and public accommodations into state transportation. We passed laws prohibiting segregation in employment and in housing. Uh, but yet, uh, at the end of the 20th century, we had uh, completely, uh, rather at the end of the 1960s, not in the 20th century, at the end of the 1960s, we had persuaded the country uh, mostly that segregation was wrong and immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, uh, incompatible with our self conception as a constitutional democracy. And yet, despite all the progress we made in the 1960s, we left untouched the fact that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, clearly defined areas that are all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that are either all black or mostly black. I mean, how can it be that having come to the conclusion pretty much as a nation that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our role as a citizens in a democracy, how can it be we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Partly uh, it's because Ending segregation in neighborhoods is harder than ending segregation in lunch counters. We abolish segregation in lunch counters, the next day you can go to any restaurant you want. But if you abolish segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, sort of blacks, whites, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Northern and Southerners, all of us, is adopted a rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves for failing to um, address the biggest segregation of all. And that excuse uh, goes something like this. The segregation of restaurants or buses or schools or colleges, we tell ourselves that that was all the result of government action. Uh, if the federal government was segregating, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. State and local governments were doing it. It was a violation of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. In each case, where there are civil rights violations, we understand uh, basic foundations of American citizenship that we have an obligation to remedy it. We have to remedy civil rights violations. We can't tolerate them. But racial segregation of neighborhoods, we tell ourselves, well, that's something entirely different. That wasn't caused by government. Government didn't do this. It just, just happened naturally. It happened because private actors, uh, landowners or landlords or homeowners refused to sell or rent homes to African Americans in white neighborhoods. Maybe uh, uh, actors in the private economy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, banks, real estate agents, discriminated in how they sold or, or rented uh, homes. Maybe it's because we say blacks and whites just like to live with each other in the same place. We feel more comfortable that way. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's all just the result of income differences. Uh, on average, African-American incomes are lower than white incomes. And so typically African-American families can't afford to move to uh, the white suburban communities that are more expensive. All of these individual bigoted, but uh, private actions, uh, self choices, economic trends is what's created neighborhood segregation. The government didn't do it. And we tell ourselves that what happened naturally can only unhappen naturally. It's not a civil rights violation because government didn't do it. 
we give a name to this myth, this rationalization that we created, we say we have de facto segregation as distinguished from all the other forms of segregation that we abolished. And for de facto segregation, we think it's too bad for most of us. We think it's, we shouldn't live in an apartheid society. It's unfortunate, but we don't feel any obligation as American citizens to do, do anything about it. Well, um, I spent uh, much of my uh, career uh, studying education policy. And uh, in the 1990s, 2000s, I was a critic of the dominant education policy in this country. Uh, it was encapsulated in the 2001 law called No Child Left Behind, which argued that the reason that African-American children have lower achievement than white children, typically, is because teachers have low expectations of black children. And if only they could make, be made to try harder, the um, achievement gap would disappear. And so we passed a law that simply required uh, that children be tested more often and that schools and teachers be held accountable for their children's test scores. And the theory of this law was by doing only that, uh, the achievement gap would disappear. It was a ludicrous law. And I was an education columnist. I wrote many columns and articles attacking this law, explaining why it was ludicrous. And I'll give you one example. I won't go into this in great detail, but uh, we know, and some of you are probably familiar with this, African-American children in low-income neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children. Four times the rate. They have asthma because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more diesel trucks driving through their, their streets in their neighborhood, uh, more deteriorated homes, more vermin in the environment. And I tried to explain in this column I wrote that if you had two groups of children who are equal in every respect, identical, same racial makeup of the two groups, same social and economic background, same family structure, except one group had a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group is going to have a higher proportion of children who really come to school drowsy, sleepless from being up at night wheezing, and would inevitably have poorer achievement. If school means anything, you have to come to school wide awake. And asthma itself is a small contributor to the achievement gap, and you add up all of the social and economic conditions that depress uh, the achievement of African-American children in low neighborhoods, they explain pretty much of the achievement gap, asthma, lead poisoning, homelessness, economic insecurity. Uh, one after another piles up the evidence for the achievement gap. So this is what I was thinking about uh, some uh, 15 years ago, a little bit less than that. In 2007, I uh, read a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it took place, uh, in, in case involved, two school districts, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of those districts understood that these were the causes of low achievement and that if you could avoid concentrating children with asthma and lead poisoning and uh, homelessness in single schools and could integrate the schools, you could have a better chance of addressing the achievement gap. And so they implemented a very, very token desegregation plan. Uh, it was a plan that gave parents the choice of which school their child would attend. But if the choice was going to exacerbate racial segregation, uh, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a parent, uh, which would not, who would not do that. So if you had a school that was all white or mostly white, and there was one place left in it, both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child would be given some preference, help to desegregate the school. It's a trivial, a trivial program. How often do you have one place left in the school? and both the black and the white child applied for it. But um, the uh, uh, Supreme Court evaluated this program in these two school districts and um, denounced it, said it was unconstitutional, said you couldn't do such a thing. And the Supreme Court said the reason you couldn't do such a thing was that um, the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated because the neighborhoods in which they were located were segregated. And they said the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle were segregated because the neighborhoods were segregated de facto because of private choice for all the reasons I just described, actions in the private economy, not by government. And the Supreme Court, the decision was written by Chief Justice John Roberts, said we have de facto segregation, some, something the government hadn't created. The government was prohibited from doing anything about it. Well, I read this decision and uh, I remembered uh, reading something some years before uh, of uh, something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky. In Louisville, Kentucky, one of the districts that was involved in this case, um, there was a white homeowner in a single family home in Louisville. 
that white homeowner um, had a friend. Uh, uh, the, the suburb he lived in was all white. He had a friend, an African-American, who was living in the center city of Louisville. Uh, that friend uh, was a decorated Navy veteran. He had a wife and a child, a good job. He wanted to move to a single family home in the suburbs, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb, the suburb of Shively, outside Louisville, bought a second home in the suburb of Shively. And he resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry white mob surrounded the home, uh, protected by the police. Uh, they uh, threw rocks through the windows. Police made no effort to stop them. They dynamited and firebombed the home. Police made no effort to stop them. And when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence. The white homeowner for sedition to having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. I said to myself, this doesn't sound so much like de facto segregation to me. If the police, the courts, the entire criminal justice system is mobilized to enforce Louisville's racial boundaries. And I looked into it further and I discovered that it wasn't just Louisville, but there were hundreds and hundreds, thousands actually of cases in the 20th century. In the North, not just the South, in Boston and New York and Chicago and Detroit, Los Angeles and San Francisco, where police protected mob violence, drove African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Every one of these cases where the police were involved was a civil rights violation. It was a violation of the 14th Amendment and requires a remedy, but we've never attempted to remedy the uh, driving of African-Americans out of their homes in uh, the 20th century by police protected violence. Sometimes these riots were led by police, instigated by the police. And then I looked into it further and I found that it wasn't just state-sponsored violence that created the segregation that we know today, but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies that contributed, that worked together, that interacted to create an apartheid society. Uh, I don't have a lot of time this afternoon, but uh, let me describe a few of those policies. Uh, uh, one was public housing. We didn't have public housing in this country before the New Deal, before the Depression, before the Roosevelt administration. The first public housing in this country was built by the first New Deal agency, the Public Works Administration. It built public housing in various parts of the country and everywhere it built it, it created segregated projects, separate projects for blacks, separate projects for whites, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Uh, that may uh, be surprising to some of you, but we had a lot of integration in the 20th century, mid 20th century in urban neighborhoods, much more than we have today. We'd be stunned if we were uh, somehow transported back to that period to see the extent of urban integration that there was for the simple reason that we were a manufacturing economy. Uh, economy. None of this uh, internet stuff, you know, we, we making things. And in order to make things, we had to locate factories near deep water ports or railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products. So if you had a factory district that was near a railroad terminal or a port and that was employing both black and white workers, the workers had to live relatively close to each other so that they could walk to work. Uh, they didn't have cars to drive into the suburbs. Maybe they'd take short streetcar rides, but these were integrated downtown working class neighborhoods. Public Works Administration frequently segregated them creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. The, the great African-American poet, novelist, playwright, Langston Hughes, uh, writes in his autobiography how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. That's not how we think of downtown Cleveland today, a working class neighborhood. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. He said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. It's what you would expect to happen in an integrated high school or an integrated neighborhood. But the Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood, demolished housing of blacks and whites to create two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation there uh, and with other projects in Cleveland that persists to this day. Uh, in, in my book, The Color of Law, I like to, to talk where I can about the self-satisfied satisfied smug places, not just San Francisco, but uh, places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example. Um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, some of you may have heard of it, it's uh, the area between Harvard and MIT called the Central Square neighborhood was an integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. It was about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration 
uh, demolished housing there to build two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, and with other segregated projects elsewhere in the Boston area, uh, created a segregation where it hadn't previously existed. I should say, by the way, that these were projects for working class families. Public housing was not for poor people in the 1930s and 1940s. It was for people who could fully pay the cost of their, uh, of their housing and their rent. They had jobs. Uh, poor people were not permitted into public housing for the most part. Uh, the people who had the jobs and could uh, be in public housing were there because there was no private housing available. And the government was providing housing at market rates for working class families on a segregated basis. Well, the policy of the federal government continued during World War II. It, um, we had uh, hundreds of thousands of workers flocking to centers of defense production uh, to um, take jobs in war plants that hadn't existed before the war. Uh, everywhere they went, they overwhelmed the communities where the war place plants were located. Uh, they, uh, uh, if the government wanted the, the ships and the tanks and the aircraft carriers to be produced, they had to find housing for the workers, and it did. And everywhere it built it. It built segregated housing for war workers, frequently for workers working in the same war plants, but who had to live separately by government order. In San Francisco, for example, uh, the government built five public housing projects for mostly shipyard workers during World War II. Four were for whites only. One was for African Americans in the Western Edition, the Fillmore District, that became the African American neighborhood of San Francisco. There wasn't a large African American population in San Francisco before World War II. There was no segregation to speak, for, speak of. The segregation was created by government housing policy during World War II. Same thing is true in Los Angeles. Watts was not a black area before World War II. It became the black neighborhood of San Francisco because that's where the federal government placed housing for black war workers um, on a segregated basis. And in Portland and Seattle as well, uh, the same policy created segregation. Uh, after World War II, we had an enormous housing shortage. And um, President Truman uh, wanted to address this housing shortage. We had millions of returning war veterans coming home uh, on top of an existing housing shortage that resulted uh, from the war and from the depression. Uh, he wanted to address it by creating a vast expansion of the National Public Housing Program. Uh, this was an expansion, um, uh, again, of housing for working class families, returning veterans who had jobs in the post-war economy. They could afford to rent apartments, but there was no housing available. Conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's housing program. I'm going to go into this, this story a little bit detailed because uh, it's very relevant to the choices we face today. They wanted to defeat it because they thought that public housing was socialistic and the private sector should be taking care of the needs of uh, returning war veterans, although the private sector wasn't doing so any more than the private sector is taking care of the needs of working class and middle class families today. At the time, the private sector was only building housing for the affluent as they are today. They wanted to defeat Truman's uh, program and they came up with a device we call a poison pill strategy. Uh, a poison pill strategy is one in Congress where opponents of a bill propose an amendment that they think can get passed. But if the amendment is passed and attached to the bill, then the entire bill becomes unpalatable to a different majority than the one that supported the amendment. And the entire bill goes down to defeat. So conservatives in Congress proposed an amendment along the following lines. They said, from now on, public housing has to be non-discriminatory. No more of the segregation in public housing. It was a cynical, cynical uh, amendment. They didn't want public housing at all, but they planned to vote for it. They assumed that they would get enough northern liberals to join them in voting for the non-discrimination amendment that it would pass. And then when the full housing bill came up on the floor of the House and the Senate, with a provision prohibiting racial discrimination, conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by Southern Democrats. That would create a new majority and the bill would go down to defeat. So liberals in Congress had a difficult choice to make. They had to, it wasn't an easy choice. I'm not minimizing the difficulties of choice they had to make. Were they going to support the non-discrimination amendment? Ensuring that no public housing would be built and the housing crisis would not be addressed? Or would they oppose the non-discrimination amendment, ensuring that uh, we could get some public housing to address the housing crisis? They made a difficult choice to oppose the non-discrimination amendment. Uh, the leading liberal in the Senate at the time, Senator Paul Douglas, got up on the floor of the Senate 
made a speech along the following lines. He said, I want to say to my Negro friend that you'll be better off if the non-discrimination amendment is defeated and you get the housing that you need than you will be if the non-discrimination amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. Well, he succeeded in persuading his liberal colleagues to vote against the non-discrimination amendment. Uh, that amendment failed. Uh, as a result, the National 1949 Housing Act was passed with a vast expansion of public housing. The federal government used that vote in Congress against non-discrimination in public housing as its justification for segregating all housing programs, not just public housing, for the next you know, 13 years after that. Um, as a result of that vote, um, we had a vast expansion of public housing. Um, you know, perhaps the most famous of it, the, the Pruitt Igo Towers in St. Louis, uh, wasn't really one project. The Pruitt Towers were for African Americans, the Igo Towers were for whites. And very soon after that, a development occurred that was quite, quite surprising to uh, housing authorities and, and uh, housing uh, specialists, and that is that all the white projects, like IGO, and in San Francisco, developed large numbers of vacancies. The black projects had long waiting lists. Pretty soon, even the most bigoted officials, uh, San Francisco among them, uh, couldn't justify a situation where um, some projects were half empty and other projects had long waiting lists. So all the projects were opened up to African Americans. Uh, at about the same time um, that public housing now is becoming predominantly an African-American institution, the um, uh, jobs left the cities. Those factory jobs that used to be near deep water ports and railroad terminals near where these public housing projects were, were based, they no longer needed to be there because the highways were being built. They could move to rural areas and to suburban areas. African-Americans now living in public housing became poorer and poorer. Soon, public housing for the first time had to be subsidized. People could no longer pay the full cost of their housing and the rent. Uh, the government then took the further step of evicting middle-class families from public housing, so they became concentrated slums for the poor and became the kind of uh, public housing that we associate with public housing today. That's not how it began. Um, the question is, why did all these, these white projects develop vacancies and the black projects long waiting lists? These were all returning war veterans living in them uh, from World War II. They had jobs in the post-war economy. They could afford housing. Why did the white projects empty out and the black projects have long waiting lists? Primarily, that was because of another federal program, even more powerful in creating segregation and public housing. And that was an explicit program of the federal government uh, to move the entire white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in white suburbs like that one Louisville that I described before. It was an explicit racial program. We were not a suburban country at that time. Uh, suburbs were a new idea. No developer could get financing to build a suburb outside the central city on the expectation that people might want to live in those places. The largest one of these, uh, you've probably heard of it, the Levittown, east of New York City, 17,000 homes in one place. What bank would be crazy enough to lend the developer, William Levitt, the money to build 17,000 homes in, in one place, uh, for which he had no buyers? San Francisco, south of San Francisco, the, the Westlake development in Daly City, built by Henry Dolger, almost as large, 15,000 homes. No bank would lend Dolger the money either. The only way that these developers in New York and in San Francisco and in every community in between uh, could get the money to build these projects was by going to the Federal Housing Administration or the Veterans Administration, presenting their plans for the development, the construction materials they were going to use, the architectural design, the uh, layout of the streets, and a commitment never to sell a home to an African American. Uh, the uh, Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration even required that Levitt and Dolger and uh, other developers place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. If any of you live in these post-war suburbs, I'll bet you if you look at the deeds to your homes or if you're in California, they were called the, the conditions, uh, CCNRs and restrictions, uh, uh, you'll see that those, that language still exists saying that your home is for Caucasians only. Uh, 
this was not the action of rogue bureaucrats, this requirement. It was written out in the policy manual of the Federal Housing Administration called the Underwriting Manual and distributed to, um, develop, to, to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of developers for bank guarantees, federal bank guarantees. The manual said that not only could you not recommend a bank guarantee for a development that would have, have African-Americans in it, but you couldn't even uh, guarantee a bank loan, have federal guarantees for a bank loan for an all-white development that was located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, and I'm quoting, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. In my book, The Color of Law, I actually have a photo of a six foot high, half wide long, mile long concrete wall that a developer of a white subdivision had to construct at the behest of the Federal Housing Administration in order to make sure that African Americans living in a nearby neighborhood couldn't walk into this all white development. This is what the federal government required. Well, those homes, uh, and the, the entire country, by the way, were suburbanized in this way. We were not, as I said, a suburban country before that time. All around the country, those homes were inexpensive, mostly for returning war veterans. Levittown, for example, and, and uh, Westlake and Daly City, those homes sold for eight, $9,000 a piece, mid 20th century. Uh, that's in today's money, inflation adjusted about $100,000. Any returning war veteran with a job in the post-war economy uh, could afford a home like that. In fact, uh, if they had a, they, a veteran with a VA loan uh, didn't even need a down payment, so they could pay less in their monthly charges for these homes than they were paying for rent in public housing. It was an enormous subsidy uh, for white returning war veterans. African Americans were prohibited from buying those homes. Required, in effect, to remain renting either in public housing or in the private market in urban areas. Over the next couple of generations, those homes gained in value. Uh, the white homeowners gained equity in the appreciation and the value of their homes. Homes that they bought for the equivalent of $100,000 uh, in, in 1950 or 1949 or around there are now sold for $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, in some places for a million dollars in this area of San Francisco. Um, those white families gained wealth. Uh, African Americans were prohibited from gaining this wealth uh, in a similar fashion. The result is that today, African American incomes are about 60%, 60% of white incomes on average. Uh, there's a story behind that. It's also a story of unconstitutional federal action, but I won't go into it now, but 60% uh, income ratio. Do you think that families with the same income would be able to save the same amount, and uh, if there was a 60% income ratio, there'd be something like a 60% wealth ratio as well. But in fact, while there's a 60% income ratio, African American household wealth is about 7% of white wealth today. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% or 7% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century, and that has never been remedied. There are many, many African American families today, working class families, middle class families, who have jobs, who could afford to buy homes, to own their own homes, but who have no down payments for them because they didn't inherit wealth from their parents and grandparents as a result of this federal policy. So that's the con that's an ongoing consequence of uh, the racial segregation we created. Uh, in addition to the wealth gap, uh, and I mentioned earlier the achievement gap of children in school, uh, other consequences or health disparities between African Americans and whites. African Americans have uh, shorter life expectancies, greater rates of heart disease because they live in more dangerous, more polluted neighborhoods. It causes a mass incarceration crisis that disproportionately incarcerates young black men who are concentrated in neighborhoods without good jobs and without even access to those jobs and who then get involved in confrontations with, with police. It also predicts, I think, a uh, very, very dangerous, uh, frightening, really, uh, political polarization in this country today, which largely tracks racial lines. It's not entirely racial, but it's pretty racial. How can we ever expect to develop the common identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that they have no ability to understand each other, to empathize with each other. 
It's a very, very dangerous segregation we've created. The policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Housing experts know what they are. Uh, I know that you and, Nim and Yimby focus on increasing density, but increasing density alone will not create opportunities for African Americans. We need race specific policies as well. Uh, certainly, we have a housing crisis that affects white middle class professional workers who cannot afford to buy homes in these suburbs either. An increase in density in wealthy communities will create greater opportunities and address that housing crisis. But without subsidies for African Americans to make up for this enormous wealth gap that we've created and for other aspects of lack of opportunity, uh, increasing density alone, which is a first step, will not be sufficient to redress the segregation we've created. Other policies are well known. We, of course, uh, as I said, we need affirmative action in housing. Uh, we should, for example, uh, be the federal government should be purchasing homes at market rates for, uh, uh, for African Americans and reselling them to African Americans at rates that are comparable to what they would have paid in the 20th century if they'd been permitted to do so. That would be a narrowly targeted affirmative action program for housing that would have to up, uh, withstand con uh, con constitutional scrutiny because it's, it specifically addresses a violation that the Supreme Court has up to now refused to recognize existed being oblivious to this history. We should be uh, creating housing, as I say, mixed income housing that's subsidized, uh, that includes both market rate workforce housing and housing for low income families in um, communities all across the country. We have a low income housing tax credit program today, the biggest program we have for low income families. It's administered by the Federal Treasury Department. Uh, it uh, gives developers a subsidy to build housing for lower income families. That low income housing tax credit program reinforces segregation. The Treasury Department regulations say that a priority for placing low income housing should be in already low income neighborhoods on the theory that if you do so, you will revitalize that, that, uh, those neighborhoods. The theory makes no sense. We should have the opposite priority. We should be placing housing for minority families in white neighborhoods, not in existing low income neighborhoods only. Uh, the Section 8 voucher program has a, a similar effect. It's reinforces segregation, it's a subsidy for families, um, uh, to rent apartments, and it disproportionately places those families in low-income segregated neighborhoods because apartments aren't affordable elsewhere. It reinforces segregation. As I say, the policies to redress segregation are well known. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to make it uncomfortable to maintain the present I'm hopeful that such a new civil rights movement will arise. We have a national conversation about race today that's more accurate and passionate than we've ever had before in American history. So I think it's possible that such a new civil rights movement will arise. Uh, I am working with a group of national civil rights leaders to try to see if we can spur it. We, of course, had to put it on hold during the coronavirus shutdown. But um, when we return back to normal in this country, we will announce the formation of that organization. And I hope I can see many of you joining me in, in that movement. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm glad to take whatever questions you might have. <clears throat> thank you so much. That was just uh, so much phenomenal information. And I, I hope, I think everyone, I can speak for everyone on the call, we're learning a lot, taking us to class today, I appreciate that. And I know that, uh, sign me up for when that organization gets founded. I, I, I want to be a part of that. Um, and I'm sure uh, all of us here at California may want to. Um, I'm going to dive into a couple, some questions here, um, if that's okay with you. Um, before I do, it, Richard, is it possible to turn your, um, your volume up, your, up just a little bit? I know we were trying before, if you could get it up a little bit. And if you're listening, if you're having trouble hearing, if you could just crank your volume up on your computer a little bit, and, and uh, that should help. That's, help. that's helped me a little bit here. Um, the question I, first question I want to ask is, April is the National Fair Housing Month, National uh, celebrating the passage of Fair Housing Act in April 1968, the national law that prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, color, national religion, um, national origin, and gender. Um, and you touched on this a little bit. Unfortunately, in California, recent research from the University UCLA finds that some segregation has never been worse 
especially in California's Latino population. Similarly, research from the University of California, Berkeley, finds that the Bay Area today is more segregated now than it was in 1970, right after the enactment of the Fair Housing Act. So it's clear that we haven't made the uh, significant progress to advance fair housing in these two great communities, as you just mentioned. Can you touch on a little more why you think that is? Well, the Fair Housing Act uh, prohibited discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. It did nothing about the inability of people who've been dis historically discriminated against to afford that housing. The, federal, the Fair Housing Act doesn't uh, do anything to enable people to afford it. So, for example, I gave the example of Levittown or, or any, any of these other suburbs that were developed. Um, Levittown today is as a result of the Fair Housing Act, where, which African-Americans are now permitted into Levittown. It has an African-American population of about 2%. In a broader area, that's about 15% African-American. So that difference between 2% and 15% is what the Fair Housing Act couldn't address. We cannot address that simply with the Fair Housing Act. The only way we can do it is making those homes affordable to African-Americans when they would have been affordable uh, when African-Americans wanted to purchase them but were prohibited from doing so. The only way to do that is to subsidize uh, with an explicit racial program uh, their purchase of homes in those communities. So that's an example of why the Fair Housing Act itself is inadequate. Now, there are many other problems with the Fair Housing Act. Of course, even the prohibition on discrimination has not been uh, fully enforced. We still have a lot of racial steering by real estate agents who won't sell homes to African-Americans or show homes to African-Americans in white neighborhoods or make it very difficult for African-Americans to, to look at them. Uh, the same thing is true to a lesser extent for, for uh, Hispanics. Um, so the Fair Housing Act needs better enforcement. But the, the main problem with it is that prohibiting ongoing discrimination will not in itself redress the, the violations of the Constitution that created in the 20th century. On that note, um, I'm going to bring in a question from Shane Phillips. Thank you, Shane. Um, there seems to be very little appetite among the broader American public to provide, provide redress or compensation for the oppression of dispossession of Black Americans. Assuming um, such explicitly race-based reparations are unlikely to occur, even if they would be preferable, do you have any ideas for policies that could undo some of these harms in a way that could be viewed as race-blind, but nonetheless provides disproportionate benefits to Black Americans and other disadvantaged and historically oppressed groups? No, I don't think race-blind uh, policies will do it uh, because, uh, as I said, there, were, uh, there are specific disadvantages that African-Americans face as a result of unconstitutional policy that others don't face. Um, but um, uh, let me just say a, a more important answer to that question is that, you know, when I was young, and you can see I'm probably older than most people on this call, maybe everyone, uh, when I was young, uh, there was no appetite for desegregating restaurants or lunch counters or buses either. And uh, a movement of activists made it uncomfortable to maintain those policies of segregation. And unless um, another movement like that, now I'm not saying the tactics will be the same, some may be similar, uh, some may be different, but unless we have activism, not just policy ideas, we're not going to redress this problem. I do believe, as I said, that we're having a more accurate and passionate discussion about race in this country than we ever have had before. Uh, uh, my book, The Color of Law, has gotten a, a astounding attention, but it's not just my book. Uh, Brian Stevenson wrote uh, Just Mercy, which has gotten wide attention. Michelle Alexander wrote the New Jim Crow, it's gotten wide attention. We have white elected Southern politicians running around the South removing statues that uh, commemorate uh, soldiers who defended slavery in the Confederacy. Well, that was unheard of 10 years ago. Uh, we have popular writers like ta Coates uh, uh, advocating reparations. The reparations is something that was talked about uh, publicly, openly in um, uh, the democratic presidential debates. So we're having that conversation. It needs to take the next step into action, uh, but the conversation is, is necessary first but unless we do that, unless we do have a new civil rights movement of, of activists 
uh, not just the policy experts. Uh, we're not going to create that appetite that you talk about, but the appetite can be created. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. We got to call it out, right? <laughs> we got to call it out. Um, I'm going to take another question. Here's another question from uh, Jeremy Ogle. Um, why wasn't all this evidence of de jure segregation presented at trial? Have the courts engaged with the facts in your book since the Supreme Court decision? No. Um, at this point, um, there is no possible, well, I say no, there's little possible litigation that's possible to redress this in the first instance. We need to adopt affirmative action policies, which will then require defense in the courts. But there's nobody, no, there, there are very few people who could claim to be plaintiffs uh, who experienced the discrimination of the 20th century that's now been handed down generation to generation. You can't very well file a suit saying I'm entitled to a subsidy to move into uh, Levittown or Westlake because my grandfather was denied permission to move there. Uh, that's not a close enough nexus uh, under our, our legal theories, our jurisprudence to create a standing. So you can't resolve this with uh, litigation primarily. Well, there are some cases, uh, you know, I don't want to go into details, technical details. There are some cases that could be filed, but basically what's needed is legislative solutions that then will require defense in the courts. So it's not as though lawyers will be, civil rights lawyers will be out of business. There'll be plenty of them to do, but the first step has to be enacting policies to remedy this and then we can take to the courts to defend them. So while we're talking about policies, as you know, YIMBYs are strong advocates for zoning reform. And you've mentioned in interviews that repealing exclusionary zoning ordinances in high opportunity areas, middle class and single family neighborhoods, specifically those that have excluded minorities in the past, as you mentioned earlier, um, are some of the most important integration policy. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that what other solutions do you think could begin to reverse this history of segregation, like specific solutions you think could reverse this history of segregation and, uh, and build some wealth? Well, I think zoning reform that increases density is an essential first step, but it's not the last step. As I indicated before, you can um, increase density and wind up in, uh, in communities like San Francisco only creating housing for um, well-paid professionals who themselves can't afford housing anywhere near where they work. So increasing density is a first step. It's essential. We need to abolish, we should abolish single family zoning nationwide. I think under a, a, a reasonable constitutional theory would say that increase, that, that single family zoning is uh, designed to perpetuate segregation and therefore itself is unconstitutional. So we should prohibit in, uh, single family zoning, but we need to go beyond that. Uh, in order to, we have gentrifying neighborhoods everywhere. We know what the policies to uh, prevent gentrification from displacing large numbers of uh, minority families, African-American families and Hispanic families who live in the neighborhoods of being gentrified. We know what the policies are. They should be rent control. We should have limits on condominium conversions. We should have um, inclusionary zoning policies for larger uh, developments. Uh, all of those things, we should create land trusts to buy up land to create affordable housing. All of those are necessary in addition to increasing density uh, in potentially gentrifying communities. I'm, I, let me just say, I'm very much in favor of increasing density. As, as you know, I was in favor of the two bills that the NIMBY promoted, but I never claimed that uh, increasing density alone would solve the problem. Here's an interesting question from April Danzer. Um, is making low income housing for single mothers a specific type of person, uh, making low income housing for single mothers or a specific type of person a form of discrimination? I don't know that we have any policies specifically to create housing for single mothers. We have, um, policies that create housing for low-income families, many of whom may be headed by a single mother, but the policies don't specifically require, like the Section 8 voucher program, for example, um, uh, don't require that the, the recipients be single mothers. 
So I don't think uh, I don't think that's an issue. Um, here's a question from Ginger Hitsky. Sorry, Ginger, if I mispronounced that last name. Um, should the low income housing tax credit program be used to generate affordable for sale housing for low income households? Yes, I, I think that the uh, low income housing tax credit should not be used to create uh, complexes for low income families only. We should everywhere be creating mixed income housing for market that includes market rate units, workforce units for teachers, uh, police, nurses, uh, firefighters, uh, uh, truck drivers, um, and uh, low income units as well. Uh, segregating uh, low-income families and single buildings, even if they are in a high-opportunity community, is not much better than segregating them in low-income neighborhoods. It's a different form of segregation. Uh, our goal should be always and everywhere to create mixed-income housing wherever we can. Um, I think we have time for just one or two more here. Um, this one is from Brendan Dentino. Uh, very little structural change on housing occurred following 2008 financial crisis. What do you think needs to change following the current recession? Is there any hope for it? Well, I'm going to repeat myself. What needs to be changed is you need to be part of a civil rights movement that's going to demand these changes. The idea is, like I say, we know what to do. It's not difficult to know what to do. Um, we should... Uh, um, it, after the 2008 financial crisis, we should have um, protected people uh, whose homes were foreclosed because of racially um, intended exploitation of the subprime mo uh, mortgage market. Uh, we should have done that. We know how to do that. We didn't do it because there was no popular demand to do it. Um, today, uh, we have another enormous housing crisis as a result of the coronavirus. And we need to protect people in their homes. There needs to be a moratorium on, on rental payments as part of the response to the uh, coronavirus. Not just for three months, it's going to be much longer than that until people get back to work. So we know, again, what the policies are. Uh, what's needed is a civil rights movement to demand them. You know what to do. Um, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Uh, I, well, go, I think we have time for one more. Uh, this one's from Sean Dannon. Uh, Dr. Rothstein, do you believe that owner occupancy requirements as part of policy today can have harmful and segregating implications? I ask because it is part of some of the ADU laws California passed that went into effect in 2020. I believe they are designed to make sure residents have buy-in with the neighborhood, but I can see them having unintended consequences. Yeah, I think that, um, I, look, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but on its face, it seems to me an unreasonable requirement. I don't see any reason why you can't rent. To, if, if, if you own a, a single family home and, and uh, uh, use the abolition of single family zoning or the permission for aid to use to create a rental unit, uh, I don't see why uh, that should, should not be, be permitted. Uh, one thing we should prohibit is vacant uh, units created for speculative purposes that don't house anybody. That's something we should be prohibiting. But uh, maybe I'm wrong, and, and I would welcome your email if, if you can tell me why I'm wrong. But uh, uh, I don't see it uh, necessary to require every ADU unit to be occupied by its owner. In fact, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that. We actually here at California again be sponsored the bill to eliminate homeowner occupancy requirements in ADU law, AB881. So we're right there with you. <laughs> we're right there with you. Um, let's. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I, just because we're getting clean close to time, uh, Richard, one, just thank you so much for uh, jumping on the call and just giving us so much vast uh, information on the subject and a topic obviously that's near and dear to my heart, but also to hear um, at California EMB and to all those that are out there listening. Um, and uh, I love that. I think you said it best. We, we know what to do. We just got to get out there and do roll our sleeves up and do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, so I just want to just thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, for answering all our questions, and I'm going to bring Brian back uh, to close us out. 
thank you, Constantine. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for this very enlightening uh, history lesson. I 100% agree that EMB policies like permitting increased home building are necessary, but they are not sufficient to achieve racial equity. Uh, I also agree that many of our affordable housing um, uh, policies further racial segregation by directing housing subsidies to segregated communities. Um, while we need to remove uh, barriers to home building, we also need to think what type of targeted subsidy programs can redress uh, segregation. Now, I would suggest that we need to look at the biggest source of housing funding um, in California, which is the mortgage interest deduction. California spends about $5 billion every year to subsidize mortgages. A huge percentage of that goes to high income people. And there's a ton of research that shows that the MID does not in fact encourage first time home ownership. We, so I'd say expect to hear more from California in the future uh, as we continue to work with racial justice organizations to craft policy solutions to remedy racial segregation. Um, but more than policy solutions, we need activism, we need a movement. Um, as Richard noted, and I'm so happy that the hist hist history policy wonk uh, said that, yeah, like we need more ideas, sure, but we mostly know what to do. We need a political movement that demands it. Please join California YIMBY if you're not already a member. Please get involved with your local YIMBY group. Please check out our website uh, at cayimby.org slash action hyphen hub, uh, which uh, can connect you to our local organizers, connect you to our events, um, and will help you plug in uh, to activism at the local level. Uh, so uh, two uh, final plugs uh, for me. Um, uh, please uh, ch check out our virtual town hall with Assemblymember Robert Rivas on Friday, May 1st from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, the Assemblymember is going to discuss uh, his work to support uh, farm workers build housing and address uh, COVID-19. And he has uh, legislation that is, um, while it is not racially targeted in quite the way that I think Richard might support. It is, it is policy that is designed to increase home ownership for Californians of, of color. Uh, um, and then on that note, um, please also join us uh, as we uh, host a panel discussion with the Greenlining Institute, V200, and the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals to discuss how we can use home ownership as a tool to close the racial wealth gap. Uh, that talk will be on Tuesday, May 12th from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, so we're all out of time here, and I just want to thank everyone again uh, for joining us. Um, please continue to shelter in place and stay safe. Take care. Thank you everyone for attending. This webinar has been recorded. This event has been recorded and is, will be available both through our Facebook page, facebook.com slash CAMB, and through CAMB.org slash events later in the week. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful evening.